All right, reflexes and conditioning. Um, a couple of specific words that are gonna be really useful in here. Um, stimulus is the first one. Uh, a stimulus is simply a change in your environment. And it could be the external environment or it could be the internal environment. So I'll just explain that a little bit. Um, by giving an example, and the example is um, something like pupils. Okay, uh, if you shine a bright light on somebody's eye, the pupil, the hole will, let's get the green eyes one up, um, the pupil will shrink. Okay, and in darker conditions, it will dilate, it will widen. So here it's uh, the muscles controlling the size of the pupil, the muscles in the iris, which are actually in this bit here, um, will contract and make it smaller. The stimulus is the change in light levels. If the light changes from being dark to light, you've changed something, that's an external stimulus because it's on the outside. An internal stimulus might be something like uh, an increase in your body temperature, for example, or an increase in blood sugar, something that changes inside your body. So your stimulus, uh, stimulus or stimuli are things that you can detect, changes in your environment that you can detect. Now, uh, a simple reflex or reflexes are protective measures that your body takes if the stimulus potentially could be dangerous. So this reflex here, the pupil reflex, is protective because it's preventing too much light getting in the eye which might damage it. And what simple reflexes do is they increase your chance of survival. And that's for any animal. Um, uh, what we'd call a reflex is a simple response to a stimulus um, that increases the, the animal's chance of surviving in some way and crucially it's automatic. It's also going to be pretty fast and we'll see why in a second. So it's an automatic response to these um, stimuli. Okay. Um, another useful word to put in here is effectors. And effectors come in two types. An effector can either be a muscle or it can be a gland. Muscles in the case of, uh, for example, moving the, uh, change the size of the pupil. But we can also have glands. So for example, um, if you hear a very loud sound, um, one of the, the responses can be that you release adrenaline and that's squeezed out of a gland, um, producing saliva when you are thinking about eating some food. You know, probably if you imagine right now eating something hot like a curry or chili or even something sour like a lemon, you can actually feel you'll just start producing uh, saliva from the glands in your cheeks and underneath your tongue. So muscles or glands are involved in um, these simple reflexes. They help us survive in some way. Now, the reflex itself is controlled by the spinal cord in most cases. I'll tell you when, there's, um, when it doesn't work like that. If, for example, I touch something, let's imagine this pen was red hot. If I touched it, there were receptor cells in my fingers don't ever say there are nerves in there it's receptor cells that would detect the change in temperature a nerve you know, impulse would be sent down a sensory neuron all the way down my hand let's just go here from here's my effect uh, here's my receptor cell sensory neuron it would reach the spine there's a synapse there up it goes to my brain my brain would think about it and say goodness me that's hot I need to move my hand out the way message would come back down and off it would go to an effector in this case it'd be a muscle Choose red for the muscle, why not? And I would move my hand. Now, of course, that takes a couple of seconds, well, a fraction of a second perhaps, by which time I might have damaged my hand. Damaging my hand is not good because it um, reduces my chances of survival. So I need to be able to move a little bit quicker. So, in the case of a reflex, I have this little relay neuron in the middle. Remember that that's a sensory neuron and that's a motor neuron. These are all parts of the peripheral nervous system. It's much quicker because it doesn't have as far to travel. It still goes up there, but by the time I've, my brain's decided what's happening and where the message is coming from, what I have to do, I've already moved my hand. Now, I did say that mostly it's controlled by the spinal cord. Reflexes um, to do with parts of your head, so things like um, the pupil reflex, for example, are actually controlled in the brain. And it makes sense, really. You don't want to be sending messages um, from your eyes all the way back down your spinal cord to, to get to a reflex. It's done up here, so... That is one of the um, examples it gives in the book, which is slightly different. Now, conditioning, which is linked to this, um, purple one up, was came from a set of uh, experiments. 
done by a Russian scientist called Pavlov. And what he did uh, in the actual experiment, it was a bit meaner than this show you in the book. He got a little doggy and uh, he basically put it into, uh, kind of strapped it down in a cage and he put tubes down its throat into its stomach. And what would happen is the um, he would bring the dog food, the dog would smell the food. So there's the stimulus, the smell of the food. Um, the dog would then produce gastric juices. And these are things like uh, produce acid in its stomach and enzymes. Why? Because it's preparing to eat food. It's a reflex, it's automatic, it doesn't think about it. How does it increase its chance of survival? Um, it makes it easier for, to digest food more quickly, which you know, is a big thing for, for the dog to be able to do. Um, normally when they show you this in the books, instead of showing you the tube going to its stomach, they just talk about the dog producing saliva. When dogs are hungry, when they smell food, they produce a lot of drool. Um, the effect's the same. Now what he then did, his primary stimulus was the smell or the sight of the food. What he did is he got the dog to associate a secondary stimulus. And the key is the secondary stimulus wouldn't have anything to do with the primary stimulus. So the classic one they show you is a bell, um, but it doesn't have to be the sound of a bell. You could do it with a light coming on, you could do it with the sound of a horn, you could do it with a word, you could show the dog a photograph of the sun. As long as you keep doing you know, dress up as a clown, doesn't matter. As long as the secondary stimulus comes at the same time as this primary stimulus, the dog will start to link the two things together. Okay, and then you can take away the, the primary stimulus, the secondary stimulus comes, and you will still get the response of the drool. So the examples it gives in the, the book are there's two examples with pets, because pets do a lot of this conditioning. Um, things like the sound of a tin opener, or even a drawer opening, um, dogs and cats will often realise, or the, the sound of a lead, um, you know, if you've got a dog that would, um, as soon as they hear a lead jingling, they often know that they're going for a walk and get excited. All these little pet carriers, the other example they give, you, know, you put your cat in when you take it to the vet to give it a jab. Um, and what cats will start to do is they'll associate being in the carrier with going to the vets, which they don't like. So one of the things you're supposed to do is, even when you're taking the cat somewhere um, that isn't an unpleasant trip like the vets, um, to use this carrier so it doesn't learn to associate the, the two things together and try and escape.